welcome back to my channel. My name is Lucy Bean and today I'm gonna to be answering some uncomfortable questions. I've got my flat white here. I went outside to go get it. It rained, I got wet, fun story. Right, let's pop that here. So I've partnered with Caniston for this video because they want to get people talking about uncomfortable topics to reduce the stigma around those issues, including around intimate health. I, for one, am all on board with that. If we can get comfortable talking about these topics, it can make us more confident and in turn help us make better choices. And please remember, I'm not a health expert, these are all my own opinions, and if you are worried about anything to do with your intimate health, please speak to a pharmacist for advice. So let's get into the questions. I've never done a video like this before, I'm actually quite excited. Have you ever had thrush? Yes, I have. I've had it once or twice. I found it deeply unpleasant and I really feel for people who get it a lot and are prone to it because my goodness, it was an uncomfortable experience. How can I feel comfortable with my body again after getting an intimate health condition? That's a good question because it can be super, super hard to feel sexy again after something so unsexy happens to you down there. So if I'm feeling unsexy and that's often due to having some kind of condition down here, I'm purposefully not saying like vagina or vulva or anything because it could be any number of things in your laid gone. Oh, what a horrible phrase. Oh dear, I wish there was a good slang phrase for your genitals. Anyway, back on topic. One of my favorite ways of feeling sexy again is buying some new underwear, some matching underwear that I can prance around my room in and just look at myself in and be like, yeah, you're fit. Good work, 10 out of 10. I think another really important thing is to take preventative measures, which are try and keep your intimate area in tip-top shape. Caniston make a probiotic vaginal capsule called Canisflor. Canisflor helps to prevent reoccurrence of infections such as thrush and BV, which is bacterial vaginosis. It gives you that extra security and helps you feel more in control of your intimate health instead of feeling like you're at the mercy of another infection at any moment. So if you're prone to thrush or bacterial vaginosis, it can be a really good thing to get hold of. Do you always pee after sex? Yes. <laughs> I think it's really important to take good care of my intimate health and that is one of the easiest ways that I can do it. If you're worried that you've got a bacterial infection like bacterial vaginosis, you can use Canis Test to check. It's great to have a product that can tell you what's going on down there, which you can use in a safe environment or an environment that feels safe to you, such as home. And then once you know what's what, you can treat it straight away and stop worrying. And if the test showed a positive diagnosis of BV, you can use the Canis Balance Gel. It relieves the symptoms of BV and helps you regulate the pH balance down there. How do you feel about body hair? I'm indifferent, guys. <laughs> I'm completely indifferent. If you would like body hair, wherever you would like it, embrace that, go for it. I'm not gonna stop you. I'm worried about my discharge. Is it normal? Yep, discharge is totally normal. And I think it's, it's fine. But I am no expert, so if you are worried about your discharge, please go and see a GP. Do you ever struggle with bad body image and how do you deal with that? I do. I do struggle with bad body image. I think everyone does, pretty much. I, it was weird that for a while we had just associated bad body image with women because it definitely affects everyone across the spectrum of gender. A big part of when I'm feeling weird about my body is kind of because I've become distant from it. I haven't looked in many mirrors or I haven't been interacting with my body in a comfortable environment. Obviously I film videos, I edit videos, and so I, I look at my face more than the average person and I look at my body a lot. And it means that because I spend so much time staring at myself uh, when I edit, I spend a lot less time staring at myself in a non-judgmental capacity. So I think it's about bringing back that non-judgmental kind of vision of myself. I also follow women online with a whole bunch of diverse body ranges and types and sizes and shapes. It reminds me that there's not just this one kind of woman that has narrow hips, decent boobs, tiny waist, like, I don't know, it just like, it reminds me that I'm good enough. There are some incredible people you can follow online with all the body types in the world and all the fashion senses in the world and they all look different and wonderful and it's celebrated and that makes me feel very warm in my heart. On this topic, what was your biggest insecurity as a teenager and how did you get over it? I should also add all these comments were sent to me on my social media sites, you can follow them in the links in the down bar. I think one of my biggest insecurities was my singing voice because I always thought I sounded a bit like a drowned rat, but I didn't. I was just comparing myself. I was just watching these videos of covers of these incredible people I was like, oh God, I'm so bad. You know, I can't sound like this. I can't do runs, I can't do this. And I didn't realize it was all about practicing. And that when you practice something, you get better at it naturally. You know Ed Sheeran? Ed Sheeran always says like, his voice was terrible when he started and that he would never play his demos now to anyone. The more I've sung, the more my voice has improved. And 
I'm still insecure about it, but I'm a lot less insecure about it than I was as a teenager. I think you've just got to embrace what you're insecure about if you love something enough and just keep going. That is such generic advice, but I hope it helps. <laughs> I love it. And that's what's important. And I've improved as well. Just a bit. Is there a difference between the self you present to friends and the self you are online? That's a good question. Yes, no. I'm very, very honest in general. And I think that reflects in my videos as well. However, just because of the nature of publicizing a lot of your life online or just any of your life, you have to be more held back and more withdrawn. Just because it is what it is. It doesn't mean I'm being fake. It just means I'm not splurging to you like, all of this stuff that's happened in my day. And also this is my job. I have to be professional to some extent. Like I do really believe that some conversations are meant to be had privately and some are meant to be had publicly and navigating that divide is what makes you a good YouTuber. Oh, I'm absolutely, I'm like, ooh, right now. What is your number one tip for people having sex for the first time? Ooh, um, this is probably really unhelpful, but I think the most important thing you can do is relax. You just don't need to experience pain the first time you have sex. There's all these myths about the hymen and all this stuff. Knowing it's not meant to be glitter and rainbows and explosions and fireworks. If you know that and you just enjoy it and have fun, then you're gonna have the best time you can and it's actually gonna be a better time for everyone. It's funny when it's awkward. Do you still hang out with any of the people you went to school with? I do. I actually have quite a few friends from school, not so much from primary school, but quite a few from my secondary school. I have my group from secondary school that I'm good friends with. And then I also have like kind of the odd friend from like, that I was really close to in that period of time. Whenever I go home, we all see each other and we have a lovely time, we try and coordinate. And then they also, a lot of them live in Manchester. So sometimes I go up there and see them as well. It's that kind of friendship where you see people once every six months, but it's like you never left. You just pick up where you left off. Do you get jealous often? I'll be real here, no. But when I do get jealous, I get so jealous. It's really bad, like it's, it's bad. <laughs> Jealousy is a really hard one because it, is natural, but I think it's one of the hardest emotions to deal with because it makes you self-reflect and you feel really bitter. And that imparts literally on your day-to-day -day interactions with people. I think bitterness breeds bitterness and you'll notice it and you feel ashamed and then shame is the worst emotion. I think specifically I get jealous of people who look a way that I'd like to look or are achieving in their career stuff that I would like to achieve. And I think specifically the career one really gets me. But I always take a step back and remind myself that one, bitterness and jealousy does not make me any better at what I do. And two, it can add fuel to the fire. So whatever I've got from that jealousy, if I can channel that into propelling myself forwards, making myself work harder, do better, that's a productive use of a bad feeling. I try and let go of the negativity that came with it and just use the base level, non-emotive side to make me work harder. Do you ever have regrets about pursuing YouTube as a career? I wouldn't say I regret it at all, not one bit. I think I've learned like five years worth of stuff in about three years. I don't regret any of it because it's given me the best like experience and opportunities of my life. It's been hard, but like, so, <laughs> like that's life. I do worry about having an online footprint that's like this big and vast because like what if I'm a different person in five years, which I ultimately will be, I'll be very different. And I've still got this huge like wad of video, of audio, of photos, like all of this stuff that I've made, which I'm proud of, but we have to churn out content on such a fast, like at such a fast rate that it means that not everything is perfect. It's not a curation of your best work at all. You have to put stuff out like a, like a journalist, like a magazine, it's so fast. And I wonder if I'll look back and be proud of everything I made. Why do you not show your boyfriend much on videos? It would affect him because obviously he'd suddenly be like a character in my videos. People would know who he was, people would be following him on things and he'd get all of the sides of what I do without actually getting to create anything. And he's a creative, and it would impact his job as well because his job is in the influencer space. Marketing human emotion is a really hard, fine line. And I can't imagine what it must be like when couples break up and they've put so much of their life on YouTube and they then have to go through and have all this pain of the memories being like, not just ingrained in their own mind, but ingrained in like 100,000, 200,000, a million other people's minds. As soon as you put a relationship online, 
it's no longer yours to invest in and your friends and families to invest in. It's 100,000 peoples to invest in. It's 500,000 peoples to invest in. And it can add a lot of extra pressure. I wonder if I can tell this story. After my last relationship broke up, I was at an event, like maybe a couple of months later. We never announced it because we never announced we were together. But some people caught on that we were dating. So three months after we'd broken up, I'm at an event and I go down the stairs, I'm about to leave. And this, I think 12 year old girl comes up to me and she starts crying. She's like, oh my God, Lucy, it's so great to meet you. And I'm like, oh no, what's wrong? And I, she's like, I'm so sorry. I just love you and your boyfriend's relationship so much. And I was like, oh my God, I can't tell this poor child that we've broken up. So I was like, so are you doing your GCSEs? <laughs> oh, it was just so unpleasant. So to give you a flavor, just a flavor of what kind of happens if you're in a relationship and then it breaks down on the internet, that is that. What do you think you could do better at? I just think I could be more environmentally like conscious and I am environmentally conscious. I just am not that good at keeping up with my ethics, if that makes sense. I'm not perfect and nobody's perfect and I'm very reluctant to put pressure on myself to try and be beyond aspirational because that was what put me in therapy for a year. So I try and really lessen the like, the intensity of like pressure on myself that I put on myself because I put a lot of pressure on myself. And being able to be compassionate towards myself and be forgiving towards myself is really important. So I kind of have to balance this like, the, the general public guilt that we have about the environment with my own understanding of how guilt negatively impacts me and actually makes me less good at being productive around those issues. So <laughs> I could be better and I will be better, but it's a slower process because I need to not, not punish myself internally for not doing the most that I can. Yeah, I think I'm done. So I hope you've enjoyed me answering those uncomfortable questions. If you'd like to see me do a second episode of this, leave your questions in the comments because you never know. You might have some other things you want to ask me. Thank you so much to Candice for working with me on this video. Candice is also looking to give away a hundred pounds worth of treat while vouchers to someone who comments on this video. If you share your experience with how you became more comfortable with your intimate health with the hashtag get comfortable, you could win. I will link the T's and C's in the description box below. Thanks again to Caniston for working with me on this video. It felt so good to talk about things that I don't normally discuss. Check the link in the description to learn more about Caniston's range of intimate health products. I am buzzing. Look at how much coffee I've drunk through this. Thanks again for watching this video. I will see you in my next one.